say, first of all, if I had known that the welcome was going to be this warm, I would have tried to swim over Friday night when they canceled the plane. And all of my friends from America who I saw this morning when we arrived said to me, what an amazing gathering you had yesterday and how powerful it was. And I looked at some of the video on the way over here from the hotel, and I must say, uh, President Rajavi, that the enthusiasm with which you were greeted uh, was second only to the enthusiasm with which I was just greeted here. But, but I urge your organization to edit the best 30 minutes to an hour of that and put it on cable in the Washington, D.C. area in the hopes that some people in the State Department might actually see the reality that this is a massive worldwide movement for liberty in Iran and not anything like the State Department's descriptions. And I think what you did yesterday was historic and extraordinary and needs to be driven home so that everybody who makes foreign policy decisions in the United States understands just how big this movement is getting, how widespread it is, and how bipartisan the American support for it is. So I commend you on a very successful day yesterday. <laughs> Allow me to talk briefly about three things. And I say this with humility, recognizing that unlike many of you, I am not an expert in this area. I am a historian by training, but it is a topic I have lived with for much of my life. I think I want to talk first about the nature of the current dictatorship, second about the correct American strategic goals with that dictatorship, and third about the very particular and immediate challenges at Camp Ashraf and Camp Liberty. First of all, the nature of the dictatorship. It's captured, I think, by Mark Bowden, who is an American journalist who is most famous for writing a book called Black Hawk Down about Somalia, but who wrote a book called Guest of the Ayatollah, which is a study of the hostage crisis of 1979-1980. The subtitle of the book was Iran's First Shots in the War Against America. And what he was capturing was that the Khomeini regime, the dictatorship which is still there, is not confused. It is a dictatorship which wants to impose a very particular power structure not only on Iranians, not only on people of the Gulf, but around the world. And it is a dictatorship engaged in repression, in anti-human rights, and in activities which are intolerable. And it is to the shame of the United Nations that they continue to treat that dictatorship as though it was a normal government, because it is not. So the first step is very simple. We will never have peace, and we will never have justice in the region as long as that dictatorship survives. That leads me to my second point, which is what should the American strategy be? Our goal should not focus on nuclear weapons. Our goal should not focus on temporary strategic deals. Our goal should be to assist the people of Iran in overthrowing the dictatorship and eliminating the dictatorship. Now, I cite this because it actually relates to what our strategy should be in Iran. I believe we should have a strategy working with every ally inside and outside the country who want to see the Iranian people have a right to freedom 
have a right to free elections, have a right to the full equality and the full role of women, and have a right to live without fear of secret police, without fear of torture, and without fear of execution. And we should be committed to that kind of Iran. <laughs> Lastly, the United States should intervene decisively over Camp Ashraf and Camp Liberty. We bear a moral responsibility. We gave a commitment as the United States. People believed in us. People protected us. Our officers who were there have told the truth again and again. And I believe the United States Congress should overrule the State Department and should insist in our intervening and we should make this a major issue with the Iraqi government. This is a government which in many ways today is closer to the Iranians than it is to the Americans. It's a government which I believe is very unreliable in terms of the values that we believe in. And I think we need to have a very deep reassessment because what's happening at Camp Liberty is a profound betrayal of America's commitment to the people who actively were helping us at a time when we needed them. And, and so uh, I can guarantee you that I will continue to carry that message back home. But let me just say one last thing on behalf of the great struggle. Uh, that President Rajavi and, and all of her supporters and her family and everyone has led. I know at times it gets very frustrating and even frightening. I've written three novels about George Washington. By Christmas Day of 1776, the, the American army had, dro had, had dropped from 30,000 to 2,500. Of the 2,500, one third didn't have shoes. They wrapped their feet in burlap bags, and when they marched, they left a trail of blood. They were desperate. And Washington crossed an icebound river in a snowstorm at night to march nine miles in the dark to surprise a military unit to try to get some kind of a victory just to keep the revolution alive. Their password that night was victory or death. And they meant it. The revolution was hanging on a thread. They won. They surprised the German unit that was at Trenton. They captured 800 soldiers at the loss of one American. And. But there are two parts of the story that I, I just want to share with you for a minute because I think sometimes it's easy to look now and, and say, oh, we have it really hard. But the revolution, the war doesn't end until 1783. This is Christmas of 1776. So despite all the heroism, all the courage, all the risk taking, all they did was avoid defeat at that point. Now, I tell you that story because freedom sometimes requires deep struggles, great sacrifices, and enormous patience. But freedom will never come unless people have the courage, the commitment, the discipline to make it a key part of their life. It's clear from the enormous event you had yesterday that you are on the edge of lighting a match which could set afire the spirit of freedom, could convince the rest of the world to be on your side against the dictatorship and could set the terms of the debate so that the dictatorship cannot survive. I commend you for your courage. I commend you for your freedom. I commend your leader for the great job she has done and her persistence and her courage. It is an honor to be here. And candidly, that welcome is something I will never forget. Thank you very much.
I would like to express my best gratitude for your presence and also for your uh, strong position vis-à-vis -vis Mullah's regime ruling Iran, vis-à-vis -vis religious dictatorship ruling Iran. You know that for the Iranian people, for the Iranian resistance, and also for the residents in Ashraf and Liberty, uh, your position, your strong position vis-à-vis -vis Mullah's regime is very important and is very valuable because you know better than me and than us that uh, now Mullah's regime is not only a threat for the Iranian people, uh, it's also a threat for all of the world. And it's a threat for the peace and security. And for this reason, I think uh, Iranian people uh, everywhere knows very well your position, your strong position. And uh, I would like to thank you for your position. And I'm sure that one day we can invite you in Tehran after the Mullah. Thank you for. Uh,